Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Luke. How many of y'all have figured out it's okay to smile in here? I was just observing some of y'all singing. You look like he's being recorded for later. Looking around like, hey, loosen up. Have a good time in God's house. How many of y'all know that God created a sense of humor? I know some of y'all are just now coming to that place in life where you can giggle a little bit and laugh and let your hair down if you got any. And have a good time, but that's okay, man. Have a good time. We're only here for a little while, right? That's right. Miss Penny? Okay, Miss Penny, tell us. A platypus. A duckbill platypus. He did, Miss Penny. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Miss Penny. Now I got to preach behind a duckbill platypus. God bless you, sister. <laughs> Luke chapter 19. Erase the platypus from your mind. We have, uh, for over a month now, been talking about uh, this new era that we have seemingly moved into, lawlessness in our country. Uh, we have been looking at that, that subject for over a month. We're trying to understand the times in which we now live, moving into this, I think, a new era. And uh, from the very beginning, the onset of this series of sermons, we, we made this statement in every sermon, because it's the truth, that lawlessness had its origins in one being. And that will climax in the end in that same being. Obviously, I'm referring to Satan. Uh, we looked at Ezekiel 38, which is just one passage where you can see where uh, the original lawless one fell or rebelled. Uh, in Isaiah, Isaiah says that he rebelled and uh he became the first lawless creature that uh, God ever created. And with that, lawlessness began. And the spirit of lawlessness uh, that we have had to deal with and humanity has dealt with and, and, and been under the influence of uh, has been pervaded or permeated throughout our history by that same lawless uh, being, which is Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, whatever you want to call him, all throughout him in history, uh, the spirit of lawlessness, which is at a, at a heightened state right now in America, amen or not, in, in, in case you're not paying attention, it is very much at a heightened state. So uh, the climax of the lawless one, and, and, and to continue that thought, and I don't want to abandon that thought even though I'm going to go in a different direction, I do want to finish that thought about it climaxing, it culminating with that one individual in the future. Uh, I don't think it's very far off. That's my personal opinion. I try not to give too many opinions from the pulpit, but that's where I'm at on the matter. I don't think it's too far off. could be another thousand years. Uh, God doesn't let us in on those details. But we see the climax, or we see the, the culminating of this in Revelation chapter 6, when John's vision showed him a white horse riding onto the scene. And on that white horse was a rider. And uh, according to Scripture, and you can or you don't have to turn there because that's not where we're going to be today. I'm just going to try to get through this quickly to close out the thought uh, that I started with. We see this, this rider on this white horse, as John describes it. And he is uh, given a crown. Uh, John says he rides out as a conqueror on a conquest. John also says he has a, and this is, this is a unusual, John said he has a, has a bow, uh, but he doesn't have a quiver. He doesn't have any arrows for the bow. John doesn't describe any weapons with him. It's simply a bow. He's on a white horse, which means, always means victory or stands for a victorious event. Uh, he's given a crown, and so we see this as Satan's Superman, the Antichrist. That's the first 
horse of what's known as the apocalypse in, in Genesis chapter 6. We see him arriving on the scene and he's given a crown. He's given this crown by the world. The world will, will just melt at his feet. He will be such a, uh, a lavishly attractive person. Uh, and I'm not so much talking about his physical appearance. I'm talking about his uh, way with words, his charisma, his personality, his attractiveness. Uh, he will be the one with all the answers when he shows up. The world is in an upheaval right now. It is confused. It is fearful. When he shows up, the world, which will be looking for answers, which will, will, will be open, this will, will be the guy. He'll have the answers, probably a political figure. He'll get along with both sides of the aisle. You know what I'm talking about if you keep up with politics. He'll, uh, he'll prescribe and, and induce a, a time of peace. It's a, it's a false time of peace. It doesn't last very long. It really doesn't even exist, but his persuasiveness and his ability to cause people to get along and put up with each other will usher in a, a false time of peace. Uh, and he will set up a time where peace and safety happens. And obviously, uh, our world right now is looking for, for peace. It's looking for safety. Friends, listen, people are living in fear inside the borders of America right now. You may not be, and I may not be, but so many people are. If they're not scared to death of this coronavirus, they're scared to death of these riots and the lack of willingness by some of uh our laws to be enforced. And so it's just a state of fear. Uh, some may even be in a panic. Now, the one that works so hard to set this environment up, Satan, uh, he is the one who, who uh, sends him on this conquest and names him as a conqueror. And the fact that he rides in without a bow or with a bow and no arrows tells us that he is a man of peace. Uh, tells us that the, the conditions are so conducive that he is going to say the right things and do the right things, plus he's going to be backed up by supernatural abilities from Satan himself, that the world will swoon to him. The world will just melt at his feet. They will follow him, his conquest. He will conquer peacefully. It's not going to be a, an era in the beginning uh, where he is domineering and forceful and and all of the things that you might, uh, might imagine, he is a peacemaker. He is someone who comes on the scene and he's got all the right answers and the world will play right into his hand. By the way, perhaps you've noticed now uh, in, in our time that um, although the world has become deaf and blind to the truth of God's word, it's very much open and totally agrees with anyone who is a smooth talker, who uh, has uh, a controversial uh, personality uh, in politics. The world seems to hang on and trust in every word of anyone that has a celebrity status. You know, every time I see one of these uh, ath professional athletes doing something stupid and the whole world makes a big deal out of it, I'm here in Arkansas saying, who cares? If you hadn't have just put them on the screen, I wouldn't even know who they are. Who cares what they do? They can kneel, they can get on their face if they want to. And, and if, our, if our television stations had any integrity about them at all, instead of shining the camera on, on some way overpaid athlete who's, who's trying to make a statement, why don't you put it on old glory? Why don't you just let us see what we want to see? Because we don't care what they do. They mean nothing. If I never get to watch a NASCAR or a basketball or a football or anything else in my life, man, look, I'm going to be okay. I'm not having withdrawals. I didn't watch it anyway. But Now, if you take the rodeo away, we're going to have to talk. But, but praise the Lord, we stand for the flag, amen or not. We salute, O glory. We love our country. We know it ain't perfect. We know we've made all kind of mistakes. But the world is open to a voice, is what I'm saying. Any voice. Some Hollywood figure that don't know their tail from a tater patch, they listen to them. They act like that they've got all the answers. They're the ones on the, being interviewed on the news. Who cares? Good grief. You make your living in a fairy tale world. Why do I want to get any information from you? I don't. 
If you're offended right now, God bless you. It's going to get worse. Hang on. So for three and a half years, this white horse rides onto the scene. He's not a man of violence. He doesn't bring war. He brings peace. He's got answers for the world's problems. And so the world says, yes, we'll take you. We'll follow you. And they do. They follow him into oblivion. They follow him into hell. And when you get to Revelation chapter 13, you see really the whole climax of lawlessness when he marches into the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and he sits on the throne in his temple and he makes an announcement I am God worship me the Bible calls it the abomination of desolation and at that point the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob the God who sent his son to save a wretch like me will pour out his wrath on this planet and all the inhabitants of this planet So I'm saying all that to finish your thought and for us to understand lawlessness will have its climax. What we are seeing now is leading up to a great culmination of events that uh, by the grace of God and the truth of his word, we're not going to be here. If you know Jesus Christ, you've not been appointed to wrath. You have escaped through the cross of Calvary and the grace of our great Savior. So how do we, God's people, how do we react to all of this that's going on? How do we as God's people function, live, breathe, work, act, and react in this new era that we seem to have moved into? Well, first of all, we need to be informed. And that's why I've been preaching uh, about this subject that I've been preaching on. First of all, we need to be informed. We don't need to be unaware. We don't need to be caught off guard. We need to be informed, and God's word is clear. Listen to me clear on how these last days will unfold. Matthew chapter 24, the most uh, wonderful uh, sermon that's ever been preached, other than the Sermon on the Mount. Is, is our Lord's discourse on the Mount of Olives, known as the Olivet Discourse, in where his disciples ask him, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The day of the Lord is the day in which the Lord returns to earth to set up his millennial kingdom. Paul taught us in 1 Thessalonians 4 that before that day can happen, excuse me, before that day can happen, God's church, his bride, must be evacuated, what we have named as the rapture of the church. A Latin word just means to be caught up, taken away. How many of you husbands in here would allow your wife, your bride, to suffer wrath? Somebody better raise their hand. Nope. Good. Praise the Lord. We're all good husbands here. None of us would, nor would the Lord Jesus Christ. We have not been appointed to wrath. But in Matthew 24, when this question was asked, Jesus responds in such a way where we can know some details about the day and the hour and the times in which we live. For instance, Jesus said, watch that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming that I am the Christ. Friend, there's heretics all over the place calling themselves Jesus of Nazareth. Has been for some time. He said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. I've just turned 51 by the grace of God. I know I don't look it, but I am. I've been hearing about wars and rumors of war all of my life. But we have had more wars in these last few years. Matter of fact, war is so prevalent at this point, you don't even hear about it. It's not even reported on the news. The battles that are still going on in Afghanistan and those places where our troops are still keeping us free, you don't even hear about it anymore because it's so prevalent. We've just gotten desensitized to it. Uh, Christ also told his disciples, this is super interesting. He said, nation will rise against nation. Now, the word nation there is the Greek word ethnos, which means race. Listen to me. Races will rise against races. That could never happen in America, could it? Kingdom against kingdom, famines, earthquakes. Luke's gospel, as given the sermon of the uh, Olivet Discourse, says pestilence, which means diseases. 
We wouldn't ever face any diseases here in good old God-blessed America, would we? So these things are unfolding at a miraculous rate right before our eyes. Matter of fact, it's happening so fast, a lot of us aren't even paying attention to how clearly and accurately it lines up with God's Word. Then he says this, but see to it, and this is for us, church, listen to me. This is how we are to respond to everything coming unraveled around us. Jesus said, but see to it that you are not alarmed. These things must happen. You getting this? Jesus told his disciples before the Lord returns and the end of the age, all of these things must happen happen but then he said but yet the end is still not and he said these are the beginnings of birth pains i've preached on that you should be familiar with it if you're from the cowboy church it just simply means that as we rush headlong toward the end of the age we will we will see more of these things that the lord uh, predicted More pestilence, more famines, more racial discourse, more uh, uneasiness, all of the wars, all of the things that he he listed. That We're going to be seeing more of it. It's becoming more frequently to us. It's going to have more fervor than it's ever had. So God's kids are to say, yeah, I know. Man, they just had this huge earthquake. Yeah, I know it. Can you believe they're they're rioting even more than they were? Uh, Hey, look, wait till November. Better put your seatbelts on. What are we supposed to do? Go stick our heads in the sand? Go, go buy some land uh, up in the mountains where nobody lives? You know what? No, we're supposed to say, yeah, I know it. My father's already told me about it. I'm good with it. Every day is a little closer. Are y'all all right? That's how God's kids are supposed to react to the times in which we live in. That's how we're supposed to understand these gloriously dark days in which we live. That's what the Bible is teaching us. So how do we react? We understand. We don't live in fear. We live in love, in power, and with a sound mind. That's what Paul told Timothy. God's not given us the spirit of fear. If you're fearful... That didn't come from God. Because if it come from God, it would, it would contradict God's word. And if God's word is contradicted, the whole game's over. It didn't. It won't. It can't. It'll never happen. And, listen to me, and here's where we're going to start preaching. And we continue on as God has called us to do. Should we change anything in these gloriously dark days in which we live? The only thing we should do as believers is mash our spiritual gas pedals. <laughs> mash our intake of God's Word. Start looking up a little bit more. Maybe put a different degree in your neck. Are y'all all right? Start looking for that great day of His coming where we will earn our rewards, which we have worked for so hard here on planet Earth. Now, a very interesting passage to me is Luke 19, where you're already at, and I'm going to tell you why it's so interesting. This parable happened on Good Friday. Jesus just uh, left Jericho, where he met old Zacchaeus. You remember Zacchaeus, don't you? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Of a... Okay, you don't know Zacchaeus. Anyway, this parable happened on Good Friday, the Friday before he died for the sins of the world. What, why does this make this parable so important for us today? Virtually, this is the last instructions given through a parable before Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. This is the last instructions given through a parable before Christ ascended back to heaven that's why this parable is an instructional parable about how we are to live until our lord returns this parable was given 50 days before he ascended to the right hand of god the father where he's at today and what he depicts in this parable to us is how we are to live until he returns with everything that's going on around us, with the world unraveling around us, this 
is our focus until he returns. Luke 19, verse 11. That's where we're going to start. 19, 11. You there say amen. The Bible says in verse 11, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Here's the reason. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He told them a parable because he was about to enter Jerusalem. He would never leave Jerusalem. He would enter as a human in human form. He would die on the cross. He would be buried in a borrowed tomb. And he would be resurrected in a glorified body. This is the last day he would be on earth the way that they've always known him. Seven days later, he'll be crucified. So this is the last parable, not the last day. This parable is about uh, Jesus and his relationship to his servants when he returns. Now, the people thought, the people being the Jewish people, the people thought that uh, the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. In other words, they thought that Jesus the Messiah, they never, gave, they never had any understanding of him being crucified and dying for the sins of the world. They were interested in the Messiah restoring the Davidic line, the king, uh, kingly line of David, and, and re restoring his throne. And they had this idea that he would do that once. Uh, they thought that they would have no more Roman rule over them. They thought that Christ would sit up his throne here in Jerusalem and that the armies of the Lord would sack the Roman armies and wipe out all of the enemies of Jerusalem. Uh, they would reign with Jesus forevermore. That was their thought. That was their hope. But they were totally wrong. The purpose of this parable is to get our minds right about life after the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Messiah. This is how we are to live today. And I hope it challenges you as much as it's challenged me. Verse 12, the Bible said, He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. Uh, this is talking about Jesus. The parable is making a reference to Jesus and his ascension to the right hand of God the Father in verse 12. Verse 13, so he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Now, this is a call to servants of Christ. That is what we are as believers. We're disciples. We're servants of the Lord. So this is a, a direct reference to us as well. He's given all of them something to work with in verse 13. In this parable, it's money. But remember, a parable is a story given to make a larger point. So some of the details of a parable can also be changed so that it will work in our life. For instance, his instructions here was that he gave them money or ten minas. Minas is a, a form of weight, but it's a reference to money here. His instructions are to put what he's given to us to work until he returns. In the immediate sense, these servants was given money to invest, money to use, money to be a benefit to his kingdom while he was gone. In our lives, in our instance, it don't have to be money. It can be whatever he's blessed us with. We are to use to glorify his kingdom, to establish his kingdom, to grow his kingdom. In other words, we are to take what he has blessed us with to use for his kingdom, not for our own good. It's for his kingdom. And while he is gone, he has already been established as king, and soon he will return. And when he returns, he is going to be very interested in what we have done with what he has given us to bless his kingdom with. And that's what you're going to see unfold in this parable. The King James Bible says in that third, latter part of verse 13, it says, occupy till I come. That's what the old King James Bible says, which I like better. It really drives it home, occupy till I return. Literally, that word occupy means to busy oneself. So in a literal sense, 
this parable is calling us in our lives, in our everyday lives, to be busy building God's kingdom with what he has given us to get the job done with. Whether it's money, whether it's talent, uh, no matter what it is, we are to be on point and focused on building his kingdom as we wait for his return. The betterment of the kingdom, that is the point of the parable. That's what we're doing. That's what we should be doing. By the way, these are instructions with expectations. These are instructions with expectations, and we're about to see that. Look at verse 14. Are y'all all right? But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. In the immediate sense, that would have been the Jews and the Pharisees. They crucified Christ. In a broader point, as we apply it to our lives, that would mean the world. How I many of you know that the, 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 the world has rejected Christ? I was looking at a, a thing this morning. Uh, uh, it's a website uh, called doawaywithjesus.org. And it's all about denouncing Christianity and doing away with the gospel. That's the world in which we live. They have said, we don't want you as king. They're going to get their wish. Matter of fact, they're already getting their wishes. So, verse 15, the Bible says, He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained. First sentence in verse 15, he was made king, however, and returned home. How many of you know that it doesn't matter what the world thinks of Jesus? He's king of kings and lord of lords. Can I just go ahead and say this? It don't matter what you think of Jesus. It don't matter what I think of Jesus. He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. And scripture says that one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess that he is lord to the glory of God the Father. We can't do anything about that. This old evil world can't do anything about that. If they could, they would, but but they can't. So up their nose with a rubber hose. <laughs> Threw a little ladies language in there just to make you old guys feel comfortable here at the Cowboy Church. I love that. <laughs> Verse 14 said, let me put it together with his subject hated him and sent a delegation. That's probably Baptist. You know, Baptists love committees. Let's just get a committee together. <clears throat> They sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. Verse 15 says he was made king anyway. Uh. That's what my Bible says right after that. Uh. He's king. Jesus is king. He's Lord of lords. He's Lord of all. Nobody can do anything about it. Not the devil. Not that third of fallen angels that went with him. Nobody can erase the fact that Jesus is king. King Jesus. Praise the Lord. Get happy at my own preaching. So God crowned Jesus king anyway. He's going to return. He will judge his servants based on what we've done with what he's given us. It's fixed to getting the britches here now. Hold on. He's going to judge us. Verse 16. The first one came. This is the first servant. Latter part of verse 15 says... He sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. Which begs the question and brings the question to us, what have we gained with what Jesus has given us? What does that mean, preacher? That means what have you and I done in this lifetime to benefit God's kingdom with the blessings that he has given us? That's a very serious question that we need to ask ourselves today. This sermon's not for that person sitting next to you. This sermon is for you, and this sermon is for me. We need to answer that question in these last days. What have I done with what God has given me in order to be a benefit to his kingdom? Can I just tell you as much as we are glad you're here today, coming in this church and sitting down, that's not being a blessing to God's kingdom. Anybody can come in here and sit down. There's people in here I ain't never seen before. 
I'm glad you're here. Man, we want you to come back. We want to get you under God's word. That ain't what he's talking about. In this 21st century, Christianity has kind of pervaded the notion, well, if you'll just show up for church, you'll do God a favor. That ain't a favor to God. It's a blessing for me to get to come here every Sunday and every Wednesday. I am blessed to be in God's house. I'm eternally grateful that I can surround myself with like-minded people that love Jesus and love his kingdom. You help me do what I'm supposed to do to build his kingdom. I pray that I help you do what you're supposed to do. Iron sharpens iron, and that's why we're all here. So we got to answer this question, and this is the heart of this parable. The first sermon, verse 16, came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Wow. So he gave him ten, right? And he earned ten more. In Lee County, that's Dublin, it ain't it? Right. So he doubled what God had given him. Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Verse 17, well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. And I ain't got time to get into that. That's a reference to the millennial kingdom where we will reign with Christ. Just throw that in. Uh, I ain't got time to get into it right now. Verse 18, the second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. So two servants show up. The first one has doubled what God give him for his kingdom. The second went half over what God had given him. Both of these were considered by our Lord as good and faithful servants. Uh, they lived in anticipation of their Lord, their King, their Master returning. When you live in anticipation of the return of the Lord, friend, you have a tendency to stay busy for Jesus. You have a tendency to take your eyes off the world and not be so focused on things that's going on around you. You kind of get heavenly minded. Uh, you just kind of have an eternal perspective. And that's how we're supposed to live. What kind of gain had we made for God's kingdom? That's a serious question that we need to answer. Someone might, might say, well, you know, Brother Trace, the Lord just really ain't giving me a whole lot. I beg to differ, friend. I, I don't believe that for a moment. Are you saved this morning? If you're within the sound of my voice and you hear me ask that question, are you saved this morning? And your answer is, yes, sir, I am. God's given you eternal life. What more can anyone give you? God's forgiven you of your sins. God's wrote your name in his book. You have eternity to live with him. I'd say that's plenty. Now the question comes, just knowing that you do have eternal life if you're saved. You do know the way to heaven if you're saved. How many people have you led to Jesus? Have you ever, 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 listen to me, have you ever, ever, ever did anything with what God has given you as, well, as far as eternal life? Have you led someone to Jesus? Have you shared your faith with anyone? Have you answered any kind of questions about the reality of heaven and hell? Have you ever took the time to have a conversation with someone about the Lord Jesus Christ? the king of glory, his propitiation for our sins? Have you ever said to anyone, hey, friend, I'm going to heaven. Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? See, if you've never done that, then you've never, ever increased what God has given you. As simple as that may sound, it's profound in so many ways because so many people never ever, ever do that. Matter of fact, a lot of people's got the notion that they don't have to do that because they hired people like me to do that. Can I tell you something? I'm not, I'm not good at that. I stand up here on Sundays and run my mouth and I preach God's word. But you know, I'm not real outward in the public. Now, this guy right here on the front row, Chris, God's given him a gift. He'll walk up to us, Wayne, good Lord, Wayne. Whoo! These guys have a gift to just approach people and be open with people. I, I don't really have that. But now if someone drops a hint, if someone cracks the door, I'm kicking it open. 
But the question is this, have you ever, 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 ever shared what Jesus Christ has done in your life with anyone? Crickets, crickets, crickets. I hear crickets. That means it's quiet in here. That would be doubling, by the way, what God has given you, wouldn't it? One person. You took the time to share with one person about what Jesus has done in your life. Friend, listen, we don't save anybody. I've never saved anybody. I've, I've had phone calls and people say, Preacher, I need you to save me. I'm like, man, you in the river? Where you at? No, I need you to save my soul. I, it's a little above my pay grade. Can't do that. But I can tell you about the one who can. I can tell you about a marvelous Savior who will make you new and keep you new the rest of your life. When we do that, we're doubling what God has given us. Let me bring it on down a little bit more. You got a roof over your head at home? Nobody living out in the woods? We've all, some of you got real nice homes. I've got a real nice home. God's been good to me, man. Let me ask you a very simple yet profound question. Have you ever used that place that you sleep in every night for God's glory? Heck yeah, preacher, I bless the food every time we eat. I ain't talking about that. Have you ever thought of, of your place as a place that God can use? You know, one of the qualifications of an elder, they must be hospitable. My home is open. It drives my wife crazy. I'll tell her, hey, and by the way, I don't recommend this, guys. Don't do this. Hey, oh, so-and-so's coming over after a while. What? When were you going to tell me? Well, he's just coming over. I'm going I'm to talk to him about the Lord, talk to him about this, talk to him about that. Hey, uh, oh, so-and-so's coming through town. They're going to stay with us Friday night. Now, my wife's kind of kind of moving toward the, that direction where she don't want to strangle me. She just rolls her eyes and wants to slap me. Have you ever used that place that you live in for the glory of God? To entertain someone where you can share with them the goodness of God? See, that's doubling what God's given you. Not only is it your home, it's your ministry office. You got a job? God give you that job. If you know how to perform things, if you know how to fix things, if you know how to drive things, if you know how to plant things and they come up and you harvest them, if you're a farmer, if you're a rancher, if you're a businessman, if you're a welder, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, a technician, if you've got a job, you draw a check. How much of that do you invest back into God's kingdom? Notice I said back because it come from God's kingdom. Are y'all all right? How's your heart on that matter? Do you want, do you want to give to God's kingdom? Do you desire, does it make you happy and joyful when you can take a portion of what he's given and you can worship him by giving it back to him? So you're doubling what God's given you. Now look, I ain't no prosperity teacher. Matter of fact, I preach against them. I don't like them. I think they're of the devil. I really do. But we take what God has given us to enhance his kingdom. And you can go a thousand different directions, a thousand miles. With us. What about your talent? You know, Chris said something a while ago that y'all really didn't catch on to. He said the song that we sung that Buddy got started here is probably the first song that we got right. You know why? Because up until that point, I was leading singing. Hey, I don't mind saying I'm not a singer. I'm up here singing every Sunday. Why? Because you won't. Because some of y'all won't get up here. I know for a fact, some of you out there, God's given a beautiful voice to. God's given you rhythm. You're musically inclined. You've got a voice. But you just sit there. You drive down the road, you out sing the radio. But when you come to God's house, you won't give back what he's given you. Can I just tell you when he shows up, he's going to ask you what you did with that voice that he gave you? 
This is not, not made-up stuff. This is what the servant wants to know, or this is what the king wants to know about the servant. What have you done with what I give you? It's true. Can you sing? Can you play an instrument? There's all kinds of things that can be done. God, anything you can do, God give you. You didn't just come up with it on your own. God give you that talent. God bless you with that so that you would return his, to his kingdom. And when he gets back, he's going to want to know. He's going to want to know what you've done with what he give you to invest into his kingdom. Can you teach? Can you preach? Well, preacher, we don't need no preachers. We got you. Yeah, we need other churches planted. Sure we do. We need to plant other churches so other people can be ministered to, to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you teach? Can you preach? Some of you talk to a, a lamp post. Some of you talk to a fence post, carry on a full conversation with a fence post. Oh, I, 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 don't give me nothing to do. <laughs> to just give it to somebody else. Somebody else left town. It's for you to do. And when the king shows up, his first thing he wants to know is what have you done with what he give you to do with for his kingdom? Here's the last thing I don't want to be caught doing. I don't want to be caught doing what he didn't gift me to do. Got a phone late last night. Hey, man, can you come to the schools in the morning with us and pray over our classrooms before they open? You bet I can. I didn't have to think about it. Man, I'll be there. Whatever else I got to do can be put on hold. The shape our country's in, and I get an opportunity to walk through these schools and win and pray over those babies' classroom, I'll come now. Because I don't want to stand before the Lord Jesus. And by the way, I'm going to stand before the Lord Jesus. And I don't want him to say to me, what did you do with what I give you? What about all the opportunities I give you to preach the gospel? What about all the people that I led to you? And you was clammed up. You was fearful. You didn't even tell a soul about what I'd done for you. We got to have a conversation over this, mister. I don't want to have that conversation with the Lord. I told someone the other day, we was talking about growing old, and I'm kind of getting old, 51. I know that's young to a lot of you, but, you know, you, you kind of turn the corner, and you start thinking about that stuff down the road. I want to die right here. Maybe not right here. You'll be tired of me by then. I want to die relevant for Jesus. Whether I'm in a wheelchair or on a walker, I want to tell somebody about what God's done in my life because I've got a vivid memory of who I was before Jesus came into my life. I know how hell-bound I was. I could feel the flames. That's how relevant I want to be. That's how relevant you need to be. All this stuff that's going on around us, it don't matter anyway. We can't do one thing about it. Our Lord has told us these things must happen. Let them happen. Be relevant for Christ. Use what he's given you to build his kingdom. Don't live in fear. Have a sound mind. Live in love. Exhibit the power that Christ has given to you. That's how we're supposed to live. Today, there's a lot going on, preacher. You can't do anything about it. You can't stop it. Jesus said these things must happen. They're just birth pains. There's more to come. And it is coming. Last thing, I gotta hurry. Good Lord. Verse 19, <clears throat> verse 20. We've seen we've seen two faithful servants. Now we're gonna see a false servant. Verse 20. Then another servant came and said, Sir. Here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. We've seen two faithful servants. Now we see a false servant. Here is what you give me to do with, God. Here's all you've blessed me with. I've done absolutely nothing with it. I kept it wrapped up in a, a napkin. I put it away. I didn't pay much attention to it. I never put much thought into it. 
I just kind of let it lay there. Didn't do anything with it. That's what he's saying, isn't it? I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. Why? These first two faithful servants lived in anticipation that the king was returning. This servant, this, this false servant, he never opened up his eyes in the morning and thought, this is the day that the Lord could return. I hope he finds me faithful. He didn't have any fear of God returning. He didn't have any fear of God. He did nothing with what God gave him. Listen to me. I know God's speaking to some of you's heart this morning because he wrung me out as I put this together. Not doing anything with what God has equipped you with will cause a conversation to happen in eternity between you and God. And when you live like this servant lived, the conversation's going to be one-sided. It's going to be a dialogue, not a monologue. And he's going to say, depart from me. I have never known you. This servant never had a desire to increase the kingdom of God. I say this all the time because it's so profound to me. It's not that the fact that a man or a woman isn't doing anything for God's kingdom. The overall problem is, is they have no desire to do anything for God's kingdom. Listen, I'm not a cheerleader. These elders aren't a cheerleader. We can't pump you up and get you sent out. It's an inward working that the Holy Spirit does in a person's life that makes them new, gives them a desire to honor the Lord, to work in his kingdom. Every day we wake up thinking about what can we do for the cause of Christ. This servant never woke up and said, what can I do with my talent for Jesus today? He hid it away. Verse 21 says, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His very own words condemn him here. Because they show that he didn't know the king at all. By the words he uses to describe the king. In verse 22 and verse 23, his master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? If you knew that I was a hard man and a, and a a man who unfairly got ill-gotten gain, that I reaped where I didn't sow and that uh, I took from others. Why didn't you know that I was going to demand something of you when I got back? Really? You could have had least, at a bare minimum, you could have put this in the bank and I could have drawn some interest in it. His words entrap him because it shows that he did not know this king. He did not have any fear of this king. If he had known that this king was really this way, at least he would have feared this king's return enough that he would have put this money in the bank and drawed him some interest on it. That's a bare minimum. But his very own words shows that he's a fake and he's a fraud. If you really knew that I was the kind of king that you said I was, then surely you would have at least put the money in the bank and let it draw interest. He's a fake. He's a fraud. Truth of the matter is, this servant didn't know this king at all. And he didn't live in anticipation of his return. And he didn't put any thought into his kingdom while the king was away. His words gave him away just like the lifestyles of so many today that name the name of Jesus Christ. It's amazing to me. Absolutely amazing. How many people you say, hey, do you know the Lord? And they say, sure I do. And their response is, I've been saved. Can I tell you that salvation is not fire insurance? God, did, God don't just save a person to keep them out of hell. Matter of fact, that's not even why he saves them. That's just a fringe benefit. 
So many people live in the past tense. I've been saved. I got my certificate. I went through the waters. I'm good now. Just call me when Jesus comes. You don't see that anywhere in, in the Bible. Can I just say this too? Nowhere in Scripture do you see anybody saying a sinner's prayer and getting saved. Wait a minute, preacher. Now, you lead us every Sunday in an invitation. I do. I'm going to lead you in one here in a little while. I'm going to invite you to Christ. But we've wrapped ourselves in 21st Christianity in this security blanket called a sinner's prayer. Just say a prayer. Friend, listen to your pastor who loves you more than you could ever know. I'm fighting for your souls this morning. Don't you dare base your eternity on some little old prayer you said and you've never changed by the Spirit of God. Don't you dare do that. You know how many people I rebaptize because they made a profession of faith at a young age and God showed them later, you've never known me and I've never known you. What are you saying to us, preacher? I'm saying don't be like this fake servant. Examine yourself, as Paul says. Do you have a desire to build God's kingdom? Do you have a desire to use what God has given you to use back in his kingdom on a daily basis? Don't be this unfaithful servant. When the king returns, he's going to have a conversation. What have you done with what I give you to do with? This guy didn't know the, the king. He had no... He had no uh, desire to serve the king he didn't even anticipate his return it caught him by surprise he made up a lie a bunch of excuses how many of you know when we stand before the lord jesus christ there is no excuse there is no wait there is no hold on there is no check the records verse 24 then he said to those standing by take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas sir they said he already has 10 Again, this is a reference to the millennial kingdom. Take what this guy wouldn't use and give it to that guy who will use it. That's called grace, folks. God can do with his stuff what he wants. Well, that seems unfair. Is that as unfair as God blessing us and not using his stuff to be a blessing back to him? Not at all. So if we've seen true faithful servants in this parable. We've seen fake servants who don't know the Lord yet they claim to now let's look at the enemies verse 27 but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them bring them here and kill them in front of me friend listen God is control of every second of every day We've seen false servants, we've seen faithful servants, and we've seen the foes of God. God will put the foes under his feet that come against him. God will judge the fake, and God will judge the faithful. In these last days, as we watch this old world unravel around us, we can get distracted, we can, we can pay more attention to the 5 o'clock news than we do God's word, but if we're smart... We better pay attention to God's word and we better understand the times in which we live and our focus should be on continuing the course that God has always called us to, to build his kingdom, to build his kingdom, to build his kingdom. There ain't no coasting in Christianity. There ain't no sailing across the line, finish with the hammer down, be in high gear for Jesus. That's what he's called us to do. Amen or not.